everybody please give it up for Dr. McGee. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thanks, thank you. No problem. I am not supposed to be here. I am not supposed to be here. My mother, who wanted to be a doctor, had me at age 19 unexpectedly. She made a very hard decision. I am not supposed to be here. We grew up in every project in Gary, Indiana. I am not supposed to be here. My values that I have now that have sustained me through my life came from my family. My grandfather, who was 95 and still was a handyman cutting grass, had me cutting grass. I learned the value of hard work and dedication. My mother, who eventually became a nurse, taught me how to care about people and how to have an early introduction to the medical field. My grandmother, who was a very religious woman, had me in church every Sunday. So I learned the importance of faith and perseverance. My father, who was in my life, taught me discipline. But yet, I like to fight. I used to fight all the time. But for me, even at an early age, I was altruistic. I cared about others, so I would take up for the kid that was getting bullied in the park. To the point where people call me the knockout artist, even at a young age. But in that alone, it caused trouble. I hung out with my cousins who didn't really like me, but every last one of them kind of went to jail, got it, eventually some of them killed some people, they sold drugs as they grew older, they were a bad influence. And I had that in my life. But I persevered through my faith, through the discipline, and through my family. I got shot at three times. Not just shots in the air, but bullets whispering past my ear. The last time that it happened, I was 16. I was at a party. I was with a cousin and a friend. As we got into my father's truck, we were leaving the party. There was a car in front. I backed up to go around. Next thing I know, I hit someone. And then I heard and felt a loud bang. I felt something in the back of my head. And I pulled out and got away because I didn't know what it was. I knew we had gotten shot at. I thought I was shot. I had blood coming from my head. The bullet went from the back of the truck through the front between me and my cousin's head, inches from my head. It wasn't until I started driving that I realized, fool, you can't be shot because you're driving. It was only the glass from the bullet hole that had gotten into my head. The next day when I looked at that car, I just broke down crying because I realized how close I came to dying. I am not supposed to be here. And then the decision to go to college or to go to the Marines. I like physical activity. I started taking boxing and martial arts. I like that. I was going to go to the Marines. My mother's like, fool, you're going to college. Even though I knew we didn't have the funds. But I did it. I went to Purdue, majored in engineering. Second year, I said, look, I really want to try to be a doctor. Went to my counselor. She told me. Black men don't really go to medical school. And even today, it's so very true. There are only 2% black men in the medical world. 2% and steadily going down. So in essence, she was right. But my faith, my perseverance, my hard work, my dedication said, nope, you're going to do this. And so I did it. And I not only did it, I failed at first. I failed my medical school interest exam. I knew I had to keep persistent. I knew I had to keep praying, and I got there. I went and got a master's in public health because I care about people. Epidemiology and biosess, I look at the numbers. They make the difference. I got into Rush, left Rush and went to NYU, where I was the only black male out of 44 residents to complete my residency. And then I went to Emory. After I left Emory, I came back to Indiana, like the, the Jacksons, because my mother, at age 57, was diagnosed with uterine cancer that was hidden in a fibroid. She died within three months. 
She left me with my grandmother, who was 94, while I left my great job at Emory to come back to Gary, depressed because I'm back in Gary. But then I said, I can't just be a doctor. I got to do more. And so here I am. This is me. Now, an ER physician, a partner with Vituity, which is a large ER group. But what I'm most proud of is I started my own foundation, POP, Project Outreach Prevention on Youth Violence, trying to make a difference, being guided and not even knowing why. And now, what I'm most proud of is I am the national chair for the National Medical Association Council on Violence Prevention. I'm coming up with protocols and best practices for preventing violence, which is a national epidemic. And how do I know that? Let me show you. Children are under fire all across the country. How do I know that? Fourth of July, the hottest time of the year. This past summer was the hottest ever. Global warming, El Nino. And everybody knows that during times of heat, shootings occur. In this case, 17 mass shootings were recorded during July 4th. Look at the areas where it occurred. Very sad. Just in Baltimore, 30 people shot, two dead. At a block party, at a fireworks show in Philadelphia, five people killed. Out of that five, two were teenagers. What did I say about situations that happened throughout that time? Out of all these shootings, at least two or three kids under the age 19, got shot or killed. That's a problem, a public health problem. Now, this is January. Look at the mass shootings. The heat doesn't make a difference. It's the senselessness of it all that does not make sense. And even physicians, healthcare workers are now under fire. We've had a 67% increase in the medical field, physicians, nurses, being affected by violence and shootings. It's a problem. My objective is for you to recognize the impact of firearms in black communities. I want to show you the effects of COVID on what it did to these communities. I also want to show you strategies and innovative policies to reduce violence. But I also want to show you and the faith-based communities what you can do. We need your help, more importantly. Just going back historically, looking at other countries, black people have been sh getting shot well more than any other race, 19.4 per 100,000. Looking at kids, traditionally, United States have been known for kids dying at a huge click when you compare us to other countries. Should not be happening. We all want to equate mental health with the reason why people shoot. Well, that's not true. According to the American Journal of Psychiatry, only 4 to 6% of people who shoot other people have mental illness. Most people with mental illness, they lack mental wellness. They don't know how to cope. They don't know how to manage their anger. Because, in fact, the people who are truly having mental health illness kill themselves. They shoot themselves. They don't want to shoot you. That's why this statistic shows you why people commit suicide far more than homicide. You also see a huge dip in terms of the number of people being shot from 2019 and 2020. It increased dramatically. Health disparities, they are there. Black lives do shatter, happening all around the country. If you look at the poorest neighborhoods, they have the most people dying from census gun violence, where it be interpersonal, domestic violence, group violence, what have you. It's happening. And it's happening in these poor communities. Why not put the resources there? Why not give them what they need to get out of that oppression and that continuous cycle? And in those same areas are the churches and the faith-based community. We all got to come together and do more, and we can. Looking at historically, this is homicide data. It shows you that black men die well more than white men. Out of this data here, 87% were male, and most of these people were shot by somebody they knew. And the saddest part of all, people think that a lot of these fights and situations that occur where someone's getting shot is from gang involvement. That's number two. I've looked at this data 
for the past six years, and it's always the number one reason as to why people get shot or injured from guns, is altercations. People don't know how to control their anger. They're angry, they're mad, and then they have access to a gun. And this is where we are. Looking at this, blacks make up 13% of the population. Black men make up 7% of that population, but account for over 52% of all of these homicides. They are the victims. 7% black males make up that 52% of homicides you see all over the country. Firearms are the leading cause of death for teenagers and kids and babies. From age 10 to 24, homicide is the number one killer for young black men and the number two killer for Hispanic men. Domestic violence, that's the number one health issue facing black women. The fear of a black woman being killed by a black man is 2.5 more likely to happen than a white woman by a white man. We're not loving our black women, and we can do better. They're killed by somebody they know, and usually with a handgun. Why is this happening? It's not just on the individual. It's not just on that parent who's in the hood. It can be all kinds of reasons. It could be substance abuse. It could be a history of violence in the, in the family. It can be poor parenting skill. It could be low socioeconomic status and not having jobs. But then the community, what community are they living in? Is there poverty? Is there high unemployment? Do you have to sell drugs to eat? These are factors that we don't always look at. And then what's the societal situation? What's the weak economic safety net? What is your community and your city doing to get you out of this, this cycle? It's happening. It could do better. The social determinants of health, we hear about this all the time, being adversely affected from health care to neighborhoods to economic stability to education. All these greatly affect what you will become in your neighborhood. But when COVID hit, it unleashed a beast in 2019 to 2020. Not only were we affected by COVID and the social determinants of health, but you could not bury your loved one. Imagine an 18 year old who was hanging on by his grandmother who raised him like he did me, and now grandmother died and I can't bury my grandmother. And now I'm out here in this world doing whatever I want. What about seeing the racial injustices and inequality and the over and under policing where police did not even want to go to the neighborhood where there was crime? And the people in that neighborhood did not want the police there. So things got worse. What about the despair, the social unrest, the homelessness, the people who couldn't eat, the lack of job, and yes, the lack of mental health care. And then access to care. In the first three months of COVID, over 2.1 million guns were bought. And it's even gotten worse. And so moving forward, this is a great study that just recently happened with Johns Hopkins. They looked at the data in 2020. They saw that over 45,000 people died, the highest ever. There was an increase by 35% of people dying from 2019 to 2020. They saw that black men, 20 times more likely to die as a victim. They saw that states with stronger gun laws had lower rates of gun violence and was less likely to die. This is a known fact. Look here. All these states, Louisiana, Alaska, and Mississippi, are all Southern. Most of them are Republican, and most of them have a high number of people who are dying and kids dying from census gun violence. New England Journal of Medicine, and this is the icing on the cake, is why you're seeing funding right now addressing this problem. They saw that now kids under 19, not just black, not just Hispanic, all kids are now dying senselessly from guns, not just from homicide, but also suicide and unintentional injuries. It's a problem now. It's su it superseded everything from motor vehicle crashes to congenital abnormalities to poisoning and overdoses. Firearm-related injuries is the number one reason why all kids are dying. And it's gotten worse in 2022, and it's gotten worse in 2023. This is important. Look in here. From 2019 to 2020, you see we went up 35%.
Well, from 2019 to 2021, we went up 40%. If you go down to mass shootings, 414 mass shootings in 2019, and 2020, 610. And steadily going up. If you look at suicide, hanging around at 23,000, and now 26,000, and now 27,000. I want to go back, looking at kids. They looked at 0 to 11, and then looked at 12 to 17. And as you can see, in 2019, 4,000 kids total got killed or injured from guns. Well, in 2021 to 2023, it's now 6,000. So it's gone up 45%. And the travesty of this is this. They only looking at 17. They're not looking at the 18 and 19-year-olds. So those numbers are even much higher. And so we got to end the gun violence. Our kids are dying. And, oh, yes, there is some parental responsibility. There's 4.6 million guns in the house that are unlocked and loaded. And the kids know where they are. And so moving forward, this is showing you the same thing. These are just kids who have gotten killed from senseless gun violence in their homes when they've gotten their parents' guns. These are all preventable deaths. We got to do better. We got to lock our guns up. We got to teach our kids to not shoot, to not play with a gun, to not look at a gun, to not point a gun, and then to tell somebody. We got to protect our kids. So we've partnered with Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement, who's given education on gun safety and locking your guns up. The churches need to be preaching this, need to be teaching our kids at an early age to not play with guns. Let's have some gun educational courses in our churches because we are the closest to the families. Let's do more community service work. Let's go out and do blood drives because guess what? When COVID hit, the blood draw stopped. People stopped donating blood. And so we had a critical crisis. You may go to a city and be in a bad car accident and go end up in Gary, Indiana, and we may not have the blood to save your life. So we got to do more blood drives. We had a 10-year low. The public health problem shows we got to define the problem. We got to look at the risk factors and develop and test strategies. We have to ensure widespread adoption of these effective programs. Looking at what we're doing, and it's our last slide, this is what our council is doing in terms of being at the table with Congress, in terms of working to promote safe stun gun swords, to partner with American Red Cross, to create a meeting of the minds coalition for all of us to come together to come up with ideas to save our youth, to promote community policing, to educate medical providers on how to stop the bleed and do CPR. Most importantly, let's engage our youth and the churches. You do have a fiduciary responsibility. Let's educate the community about the stats I mentioned, about strategies they can do to prevent violence, to also show the resources. Where can they go to get the funding they need? Let's go after these grants that are out there. Let's encourage our community to vote. Let's engage kids on all levels, not just the kids coming to your church, but the kids who are high risk, who are in the communities, who are, who are owning guns. Let's educate them. Let's, let's give them more activities to have them to be involved. Let's address the social determinants of health. Do whatever you can to educate to provide food, to provide jobs, to decrease the poverty. And oh yes, we need to focus on mental health and the post-traumatic stress disorder and then help disrupt the cycle of violence. And last, we love for you to partner with our Council on Violence Prevention. And so now you're seeing that groups of churches and communities can come together for the betterment of our youth. And so with that being said and done, it always seems impossible until it's done, especially with God on our side. Thank you.